Good morning, everyone. This is the Propeller Club of Northern California. It is February 2nd, 2021. Uh, welcome. And our speaker today is going to be James McKenna, president of the Pacific Maritime Association. Uh, Jim has a uh, call that he has to get on to at uh, noon, so he has to leave five minutes before the hour. So we are going to do very quick introductions and then we will chat a little bit um, after Jim leaves. Uh, we have some uh, people who are here that uh, we could visit with for just a couple of minutes. But uh, what I wanna do is I want to start our, doing our introductions and almost everybody seems to be here. Uh, well, we're about halfway there. So I'm gonna start the introductions um, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, Jim McKenna. Jim, would you introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Jim McKenna, President and CEO of the Pacific Maritime Association. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we have, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Kees van Pelt uh, from Holland. I'm working in the port of Rotterdam as a, a mechanical engineer. Thank you. Uh, then I will start with uh, Mr. Kirby, Thomas. Thomas. Good morning. My name is Thomas Kirby. I'm an internal organizer with the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way, part of the Rail Teamsters. Um, I'm com coming from uh, joining you from uh, Muncie, Indiana. Thank you. And your brother in uh, in the union, Mr. Kerry Dahl. Good morning, Kerry. Good morning, everybody. This is Kerry Dahl calling in from Sacramento, California. I'm the organizing director for the Brotherhood of Maintenance Away, again, the rail conference of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Thank you. Uh, Bill Nixon, good morning. Good morning. Bill Nixon, working with Transmarine Navigation Tramp Ship Agents. Thank you very much, Bill. And Mr. Arave, Kim, good morning. Good morning. Kim Arave, retired Pacific Maritime <laughs> Association, director of training. Very good. Thank you very much, Kim. And Mr. Peter Roney. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Stas. Thank you for hosting. Uh, Peter Olney, uh, retired organizing director of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Thank you very much. Mr. Brian Brandes. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Stas. Uh, Brian Brandes, director of Maritime with the Port of Oakland. Thank you very much. Scott Taylor. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have to remind myself, I'm not president and uh, CEO anymore. I'm just uh, CEO and chairman of the board of GSC Logistics, as we're honored to have our new president on board, Dave Arsenault. Uh, hopefully he'll be joining us soon, but I know he's on another call. It's a pleasure to see all your smiling faces this morning. Thank you. Scott, um, would you hang on afterwards? Um, I have a question that I want to ask you. I'm doing a story on uh, the Clean Air Action Plan, and I wanted to ask, a, I wanted to get your feedback on that. So be glad to, but I have a 12 o'clock call that I have to get on. Maybe, okay. maybe we I'll, can do it later today. That would be fine. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Andrew Wong, good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Andrew Huang, uh, Manager of Business Development and International Marketing at the Port of Oakland. Very good. Thank you. Lauren Brand. Lauren. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be here today. Uh, Lauren Brand, President of the National Association of Waterfront Employers and Executive Director of the National Maritime Safety Association. Lauren, welcome. Thank you for attending. Alice, good morning. Good morning, Alice Herring, Golden State Renewable Energy. <clears throat> Good, hi, Alice. And board member of the Propeller Club. Of course. <laughs> uh, Tosca Pinder. Good morning, Tosca. Hi, good morning. How are you? Um, Tosca Pinder, ABD Insurance. Um, I'm a marine insurance broker, actually, up here in Seattle, uh, co president of the Seattle Propeller Club. Very good. Welcome, Tosca. Anita Yao, good morning, Ms. Yao. Good morning, Anita Yao from Port of San Francisco, Wolfinger, and also board of a member, uh, 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 one of the directors. Okay, good morning, hi. Good morning. Uh, John Burge, good morning, John. 
Good morning, uh, John Berg, uh, Vice President with Pacific Merchant Shipping Association. Thank you for attending, John. Luis, I'm glad you made it. Good morning. Hello, Luis Quadra, Berg Davis Public Affairs, representing the East Oakland Stadium Alliance. Thank you, Luis. Evie Wong, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Stas. How's everyone? Uh, Evie Huang, Alba Wills Up, and uh, uh, current president of the Customs Brokers Forwarder Association and a proud board member of the Propeller Club. Um, pleased to be here, and I wanted to let you know, just got off a meeting, and Peter Friedman will join, and we also let some other people know. So if you get any late uh, registrants, you'll know where that came from. Very good. Thank you very much. And I see our port director, Danny Wan. Good morning, Mr. Port Director. Yes, how are you? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for holding this, uh, this again. And I, I just wanna say that uh, your seminars are so helpful and I look forward to hearing uh, today's presentation. Thank you very much, Danny. We appreciate that. Uh, and from the port of Long Beach, I see no Hasegawa. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Stas, and hello, everyone. I appreciate the invitation. Noel Hasegawa, Deputy Executive Director at the Port of Long Beach, and also pleased to be here looking forward to the presentation. Thank you very much, Noel, and, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, Sage, I don't have your last name, and I see you were struggling with a little one there. <laughs> yes, this is Emily Sinclair in corporate communications at the Pacer Group, and I guess my daughter Sage was uh, most recently on my Zoom, so <laughs> <Okay>. hello. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Thank uh, you. Mike Heenemann, good morning, sir. Good <clears throat> morning, Stas. Uh, Mike Heenemann, uh, Port Maritime, uh, Port of Oakland. Very good. Welcome. Uh, I see uh, Brian Bauer. Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, good morning, Brian Bauer. I'm the GM at uh, Traypack Oakland, uh, Marine Terminal Operator here. Very good, Brian, welcome. Susan Sullivan, I see you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Stas and everyone. Yes, I am here. I work with PESHA, the PESHA Group, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors. Very good, welcome, Susan. Thank uh, you. I see you take care and we'll get back to you later. Uh, Andre Coleman, good morning, sir. Good morning, Stas, and good morning, everyone. Andre Coleman, Maritime Director with the Port of San Francisco. Excited to be here. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, sir, and welcome. And uh, OK, uh, I see George Pasha here. George Pasha, are you there? And I'm here, Stas. Thank you very much. And again, appreciate uh, you hosting uh, today and look forward to Jim McKenna's comments. Thank you very much, George. And uh, I have Susan Duran. Susan? Good morning. Susan Duran with FlexiVan, uh, West Coast Chassis Pool Director. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Well, you are welcome, Susan, and thank you for attending. Um, I think I have everybody. Uh, Todd, did I get everybody? Uh, Joe just came in, uh, Joy, and uh, Frank Ramirez is coming in right now. Uh, OK, Frank Ramirez. Frank, can you hear us? And Joy Wallenberg just came on. Ellis Wallenberg. Yeah, Ellis. hi, Stas. How are you doing? Good, good. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having this. Okay. And this, I will we'll talk later. Mr. Ramirez, are you there? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, Frank Ramirez. I'm with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. I'm the Deputy Director of Goods Movement and Sustainable Freight. Okay, very good. So everybody, um, if anybody wants to stay on afterwards and uh, we'll do a couple of reintroductions, that would be fine. A couple of people have to go. Uh, Jim has to be gone at uh, five minutes to the hour. 
So uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker, who is James McKenna. He is the president of the Pacific Maritime Association, a position he's held since 2004. During his tenure, he has overseen successful contract negotiations with the ILWU and helped to make the association more business savvy. He has four decades of maritime industry experience, most recently at Horizon Lines as chief operating officer, and he holds an MBA from the University of Tennessee. Um, I have asked Jim to come and speak to us about the situation um, with the ILWU, especially as it uh, impacts the COVID situation, um, and also to discuss uh, congestion issues down at LA Long Beach. But uh, the PMA recently issued a report um, on uh, rail competitiveness issues, which is why we have a couple of uh, rail union uh, representatives with us today. And I've asked Jim if he could discuss that as well. So Jim, I made it very easy for you and uh, <laughs> we'll try and take a few uh, minutes of uh, Q&A afterwards. And um, so Jim, uh, welcome to the uh, Propeller Club and uh, we welcome your remarks and inputs and everybody make sure that they have muted themselves so we can hear Jim clearly. Is everybody muted? Good. Okay, Jim, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning again. Certainly a pleasure to be with you today. Um, nice to see a lot of familiar faces. You know, everyone being uh, working remotely, it's uh, usually you're just looking at people or listening to them on the phone, but uh, good turnout. I'm going to touch on a number of subjects today, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, first up, PMA's relationship with the ILWU. You know, I think we have a good working relationship on all levels with the ILWU. On the international level, where my senior management group and I, along with senior employer representatives, work with the members of the ILWU International on issues that impact the entire coast. And on the area level, where PMA and employer representatives work with local ILWU officials on issues specific to their areas of responsibilities. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have disagreements because that's just the nature of the business. However, I think we collectively strive to find middle ground that works for both sides. Although I do have to admit that meeting by phone or video is, is not as productive at reaching agreement as doing a face-to-face. A, a -face. Uh, but a great example of the cooperation by the two groups is the collaborative effort being put forward by both groups in addressing the issues that the pandemic has created. So that is a great segue in, into my next, uh, my next topic, and that's PMA and the ILW's progress in protecting our essential workforce from COVID-19. I can assure you these issues have consumed both parties during the past 10 months, as rightfully they should have. We are constantly meeting to discuss protocols and processes and to improve on those already in place. There's not a playbook here where you can fall back on experience or past practice. This is all new to all of us. And given the severity of the virus, it is all our attention all the time. Protocols and processes that we have jointly agreed to and put into place include, we have a portal where essential workers can self-report positive or negative results and the need to quarantine given potential exposure. And this portal helps us or assists us in tracking and tracing individuals. Next up, we have another portal, a self-reporting which allows an individual to be compensated by the industry for time missed to COVID related issues, while also helping individuals stay at home and take care of themselves when they feel ill. Next, we ensure cargo handling equipment is cleaned and sanitized after each use. And we also provide PPE to protect workers and stressing social distancing when practical. In some locations, we are even uh, conducting temperature checks prior to entering the terminals. Even with all our efforts to keep our workforce healthy, the virus has taken a tremendous toll. In Northern California, we have 72 positive cases with two deaths. 
in Southern California, the epicenter of the COVID uh, virus for the last month, month and a half. We have 855 positive cases, which half of them have occurred since the first of the year. We also have 13 deaths. In Washington, we have 66 positive cases with no deaths reported. And in Oregon, we have 41 positive cases with no deaths reported. We certainly all mourn the loss of life. Even with the health risks our workforce faces, I can't thank them enough for their dedication during these difficult times. Additionally, we collectively realize that California ports play an integral role in the economy of the state and the nation. At last count, 3.7 million California jobs are tied to California ports, creating $743 billion in total economic value and representing 32% of the state's GDP. As most of you know, in recent months, an historic surge in imports from Asia has created significant congestion that has challenged our ports and stretched the limits of the entire supply chain. At this critical juncture, it is crucial to eliminate any additional risks to the port's continuous operations. This means, first and foremost, protecting the health and well being of the men and women on the docks. The good news here is on January 25th, the state moved essential dock workers to a higher tier, which made them eligible for vaccine now. The bad news, currently there is no availability to be vaccinated. But I can assure you that we will continue to pursue on all avenues to secure the vaccine. And that's on the federal front, state and local levels. Because enabling longshore workers to receive the vaccine and remain healthy will help ensure the nation's supply chains continues to smooth, excuse me, continues to flow smoothly, including the critical PPE and metal equipment that our first responders rely on. Now let's move on to assessing the uh, Southern California, more specifically LA Long Beach congest congestion issues. As previously mentioned, a historic surge in import cargo has certainly impacted the fluidity of Southern California terminals and to a lesser degree, Oakland. It has created delays and continues to challenge the industry on an ongoing basis. There are multiple reasons that compound the problem associated with this surge in cargo, such as yard congestion due to increased dwell time and non-productive moves as terminals dig for specific box numbers versus multiple options. Next, we have warehouses being full and are having limited labor availability due to the virus. We have chassis shortages driven by containers remaining on the street longer and are being utilized for storage. Number of vessel issues, vessels at Anchorage due to no dock availability, we have vessels idle that dock due to yard congestion and no terminal room to unload. Also vessels shorted due to restricted skilled labor availability and vessels at Anchorage due to crane replacement temporary closing one berth, specifically in Oakland. However, let me be clear here. The restrictions are not only due to the surge in cargo and yard congestion but also due to the fact that at any given time, we have hundreds of longshoremen unable to work due to COVID-19. Our workforce has absolutely gone above and beyond during the pandemic. Those that can have shown up day and night and have done all they can to ensure that cargo continues to move. They absolutely deserve our appreciation and our respect for their heroic efforts. Now I'm gonna switch gears and uh, go to something that Stas already mentioned. And that's the fact that earlier this year, PMA commissioned Mercator to conduct two studies analyzing the competitiveness of US West Coast ports for the handling of discretionary cargo. These reports are each 35 to 40 pages of very detailed analysis. 
Today, I'm going to deal with each of them from a very, very high level. My disclaimer here is that these studies were completed this past summer. And given the pandemic, there has been little to nothing done with them. We, we will deal with the findings once the pandemic is under control and cargo routings return to normal. That being said, the first study I'll look at is uh, one that deals with the competitiveness of trans-Pacific routes through North American West Coast gateways. U.S. West Coast ports have seen their share of North American container imports from Asia decline over the last several years, while the two West Coast Canadian ports, Vancouver and Prince Rupert, have experienced increased shares. The, the analysis that was provided focused on intact intermodal cargo shipments that are moved through West Coast ports by rail to U.S. interior markets in the marine container in which they arrive which is considered discretionary cargo. The key conclusions of this report are the two Canadian port gateways have significant cost advantages over the two main US West Coast gateways. The two British Columbia container ports, especially Prince Rupert, have competitive transit times and have route cost advantages of up to five to $600 per import FEU for Northeast Asia loads destined for Chicago and Detroit, and three to $400 to Memphis. Cost advantages are driven by a number of key factors. They are lower unit costs for marine terminal lease rates and lower terminal labor costs. Also, avoidance of payment of the harbor maintenance tax and the Alameda corridor transit fee. Envir environmental regulations, most notably the additional cost for compliance with CARB. And last but not least, lower cost for locomotive fuel and maintenance and repair based on the fact that trains coming out of Canada only require one locomotive and trains coming out of the West Coast require two because of topography. The combination of the British Columbia cost advantages has and will continue to heighten the risk of further losses. Additionally, expansion projects currently underway in container terminals in Prince Rupert and Vancouver could provide these two ports with the physical ability by 2022 to divert 15% more of the intact intermodal cargo now moving through United States West Coast ports. Further, over 45% of the U.S. current intact intermodal cargo is at risk of dispersion to BC ports over the balance of this decade due to the two ports considering long-term planned infrastructure improvements. So that's, uh, that's quite a mouthful, but it's, it's certainly a big concern for, for the West Coast ports and, and how to deal with this uh, continuing leakage of, uh, of intermodal cargo, I should say discretionary cargo leaving the coast. Uh, finally, my last topic for today is the second Mercator study, which looks at the competitiveness of routes for Asian origin intermodal import containers through alternative U.S. gateways. Okay. The relative competitiveness of the U.S. West Coast ports for Asian imports into the interior of the U.S. versus other U.S. ports depends on from which Asian country port the cargo originates and which inland market it is destined. Examples are the two main Northeast container ports, New York, New Jersey, and Norfolk Portsmouth, have route cost advantages of several hundred dollars per import FEU over the two main U.S. West Coast gateways, LA Long Beach and Seattle Tacoma, for intact intermodal Asia imports to the Ohio Valley and Chicago. The major Southeast port, Savannah, has route cost advantages of several hundred dollars per FEU for Asian imports to Southeast markets such as Atlanta, Memphis, 
and the Ohio Valley markets and Chicago versus the two West Coast intermodal gateways. The major Gulf Coast gateway ports, Houston and Mobile, have significant browse cost advantages to Dallas and Memphis versus both LA, Long Beach and Seattle and Tacoma gateways, but presently lack sufficient marine terminal and or rail terminal capacity to capitalize on those advantages. However, recent and or pending infrastructure improvements in the ports of, ready for this? Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Baltimore and New York, New Jersey will provide capacity to handle an incremental 500,000 TEUs. Any initiative of the California or Washington governments that increase cost for US West Coast gateways and or fails to address cost advantages of the East and Gulf Coast ports will further compound the problem. This does not take into account sourcing, sourcing shifts, easy for me to say, away from Southeast and Southwest China, which benefit all water sailings through the Suez Canal which further exasperates the problem. The two main US West Coast gateways, specifically for Asian origin imports into the interior of the United States, have significant cost disadvantages versus other US port gateways. East and Gulf Coast ports have much lower rail transportation costs that offset the higher ocean transportation costs for all water services. They also have lower unit costs for marine terminal labor and lower terminal lease rates. Additionally, avoidance of the Alameda Corridor Transit Fee, San Pedro points only, San Pedro Bay ports only, Less environmental regulation, most notably no compliance with California clean air regulations, i.e. CARB. High stevedoring productivity with extensive use of tandem lifts in the southeast ports only. Route cost advantages range from, are you ready? $250 to $1,000 per FEU, depending on port and ultimate destination. Now, with all that good news, I, I, I absolutely have to leave, leave on a little bit of a positive note here. And that is the fact that LA Long Beach, as well as Seattle and Tacoma, have in general a three to four day or more transit advantage, depending on where the container originates. So that's a lot of information. Um, as I said previously, these reports are all 35 to 40 pages long, very detailed analysis and uh, um, very worthwhile looking at. But uh, with that, I'll stop here and take any questions you may have. Sus? Uh, yes, Jim, thank you very much for that very comprehensive view. Uh, and very, very quick, Jim, I mean, you do this expeditious presentation, you did a war and peace here in about 15 minutes. 17 minutes and six seconds. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we have a question from Danny Wan, uh, Oakland Executive Director. Uh, Danny, would you like to ask your question? Good. Thank you, Stas. Hey, Jim. Uh, thank you hey, for Danny. the presentation. How are you doing? Good, you? Good, good. good. Uh, just... Uh, I think this, these two questions relate to our efforts to really uh, get our messages out to the broader community of California uh, regulators, as well as our industry partners. Uh, on the COVID uh, vaccine issue, uh, we, Portable Clinic and CAPA, California Associate Port Authorities, have all uh, jointly been very concerned about uh, making sure that the vaccine priorities stay in place uh, for transportation workers at uh, the 1B, I think, um, tier. Recently, we heard some news from the governor that uh, office that that might not happen anymore, that after the, the next year, teachers and, uh, and, uh, and uh, food workers, that then they will simply go into the H tiers, uh, skipping transportation workers. 
I hope that um, that that news is uh, well might be changeable. Uh, so hopefully we'll jointly uh, get that message to the uh, to the authorities to be on the competitiveness issue. Also, we uh, every chance we get when we talk to uh, our representatives uh, that the regulation is one of the factors of cost, of course. Uh, environmental regulations. I think the message we've been putting across is not that California is not committed. We continue to be committed to zero emissions, to making sure that uh, we get the reach the governors and California goals, but that California as a whole and the industry as a whole need to really get the message across that the federal government need to equalize that, um, that disadvantage in terms of making sure the rest of the country follows up uh, in making sure that our regulations are equal uh, so that we don't have that disadvantage and that the investment in California really needs to be ramped up a whole lot uh, from the federal government infrastructure perspective. So I thought uh, uh, just to inform you what we're doing and hopefully Jim, Jim that we can coordinate, we, that we are coordinating on those messages. Yeah, I would think uh, from, from the bigger level for the vaccine itself, uh, two points for you. Um, certainly working on the federal level, we've had, uh, we've had letters from congressmen come into California, we're working on the governor's letter where myself and the head of the ILW sent a letter to all the governors up and down the coast. And on a local level, we deal with the mayors, we deal with the city council, we deal with anybody that, that will listen. And, and I can tell you, it's just not me, it's Willie Adams and his whole team. Uh, and then this is a full core press, without a doubt, uh, we continue we are, we are putting together a letter that'll go out hopefully today between uh, PMA, the ILWU and USMX and the ILA asking the same question about the vaccine. Um, we heard on the January 25th and, and yet to see it in, in writing, but that the, uh, uh, the, the state, uh, the California state had, had moved dock workers from tier 1B to tier 1A which would make them allow, put them in with the food service workers and the like. Um, but as I said previously, that's, that's great news, but if there's no vaccine, it really doesn't matter. We have set up our own site in, in Southern California. We're gonna do similar in Oakland, Seattle, Tacoma, and looking at, you know, we're working in 29 ports. So it's uh, the bigger ports will probably have something more exclusive. The little ports probably set up through a third party and, and we're using a third party vendor too, but one on a, on a national scourge. It's already putting uh, needles in people's arms, so so that that's certainly important. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more on on the environmental issues. I, I don't think it's an issue of what California is doing, but it's it's it go, gets to be a bigger issue when we're the only ones doing it. The West Coast is the only one doing it. So so a federal program is certainly warranted and absolutely needed. Very good, uh, Kim. Uh what do we have any idea when have you heard anything from the state about when the vaccines might be available? Do you have any idea at all? I, ha I heard it had a com comment from a from a public official who said maybe by the end of the week or early next week, but that's speculation. I don't think anybody knows. Uh, not good news. Well, thank you very much, Danny. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I've, there was a question about the availability of the studies uh, that Jim referred to, and Lauren Brand has made them available to everybody. So there's a link on the chat. If anybody wants to reference the studies that Jim's talking about, uh, please reference that chat. Uh, okay, are there other questions? Uh, Jim, one of the issues that uh, has come up uh, was had to, has to do with the railroads. And mm -hmm. you've talked about the difference between one locomotive and two uh, as a result of topography. Uh, but in your study, uh, the uh, finding is that there's a $400 differential um, between US West Coast uh, uh, rail and the CN, uh, the CN Railroad going to uh, Prince Rupert in Vancouver. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism from the unions that uh, the poor, that the railroads uh, are not making, uh, uh, don't serve enough customers. Uh, and we've heard that from Peter Friedman that there's been a cutback in service to exporters 
uh, because of the uh, imposition of precision scheduled railroading, which I know you're familiar with, um, are there issues, or let me put it this way, are, we have to wait till the COVID situation is over, but are there avenues that the railroads could pursue to reduce the cost of rail deliveries to U.S. West Coast ports? And uh, the, uh, my follow-up question is, why is it so much cheaper on the East Coast than it is on the West Coast? Well, the East Coast is cheaper because they're going a shorter distance, right? Okay. They're going all water service to the East Coast and the Gulf, so the distance they're running is shorter. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the favoring East Coast over West Coast. Um, if you look at, at the, the rail difference between the West Coast and Canada, yeah, it's five to $600. Um, and, and I can't tell you what the rail costs are because I don't negotiate those rates. Um, we did put a group together to look at what impact it was having and the railroads were a part of that group. Unfortunately, as I said, um, the pandemic has changed everything. So, so all these, these efforts to look at it, to analyze it, to look at, at, at you know, self-help programs, any fixes have really, have really stalled. And I think the, the real effort now, it's plain and simple got to keep workers safe. We got to keep the docks open and we got to do everything we can to get needles in people's arms. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Um, are there other questions of Jim? Yeah. Hi, Stas. This is Scott Taylor. I have a quick question. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McKenna, uh, it is uh, an honor to be in your presence. Every time you speak, all of us learn a lot more about our wonderful industry. Um, you know, the news that you delivered is sobering to all of us operating on the West Coast. Uh, we're we're uh, extremely fortunate here in Oakland that due to the unfortunate situation in Southern California, uh, there are a lot of BCOs looking at Northern California as a possible relief valve. And, and so times are Times are really looking up here for us in Oakland. Uh, we've been working for the last eight or 10 years for a first port of call, and it's finally going to happen. Uh, there are some large BCOs that have given us the uh, go ahead that they're coming into the marketplace. Uh, but with all of this said, I was wondering if the PMA uh, had a position or an opinion on the challenges that we're having here in Oakland with a potential ballpark. <laughs> uh, now that you're, you know, with you representing the largest vessel lines in the world and, and extremely successful terminal operators, uh, does the PMA have a position on a potential ballpark at the Port of Oakland? I, I would tell you that, that we work very closely with PMSA on this issue. Um, you know, they're, they're more the regulatory arm of the, of the industry versus we're more the operating arm of the industry as it would be. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're, we're absolutely concerned about the, the negative impact it can have on, on the terminal operations and, and the ability to move cargo volume through, through the port. Uh, let's mm -hmm. face it, over the last five years, uh, Oakland has seen a, a great increase. And, and it's due to, to shippers directing cargo here because I think they, they have, we have a good labor force in Oakland. And, and they've proven even during the pandemic that we can move cargo through here. And we can move more cargo. And I think that that goes to, you know, pat on the back. That's, that's all you can say. And I think it's, it's across the board, you know, it's, it's the trucking companies, it's the logistics companies, it's, it's everybody kind of pulling together. And, and I think that's why you're seeing customers or BCOs say, can we bring some cargo to Oakland? It, it makes sense. Um, but I think everybody's fear is a little bit of the known and a lot of the known. And that is that, that we could choke off the ability to move the kind of volumes we're moving into Oakland if the ballpark goes through. And, I, and I'm sorry, I missed the number. Do you know how many uh, uh, longshore workers are uh, not available for work here in Oakland? Uh, I heard the number in Southern California. Do you know what the Oakland number is? That, that number was for everyone. You know, oh. it's, it's, it's hundreds. Um, in Oakland, I, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I'm sure it's, you know, 50, 100. It, it's, it's always in flux. You know, yeah. you got guys that test positive or women that test positive. They go down for 10 to 14 days and people have to quarantine around them. And it's it's not, you know, on this day, all these people come in. It's every day it changes. It goes up, okay. it goes down. I think I think we've been we've been fortunate in Oakland that that we haven't seen the surge or the spike that we saw in Southern California. 
and that and that's for all the other ports with the exception of la long beach you know they've been pretty consistent i mean it's still a lot a lot of people and in oakland two deaths that's too too many um but but they they've done a good job of kind of managing you know the ppe making sure the trucks are clean you know trying to keep social distance where they can so Again, I think a lot goes to, to the labor force also taking this extremely seriously and, and doing what they have to, to remain healthy. Great, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, Jim, there was a uh, attempt to uh, put a, uh, uh, a sports uh, franchise up at the Port of Seattle recently. Uh, could you tell us what happened in that situation? I, I don't know the details, Stas. I know that there was a lot of talk a year or so ago and it, and it kind of faded to black. So I, I don't know if it got shut down, wasn't enough support or they said, we're not going to, you know, make that land available for a sports complex. I, I don't know the answer. Okay. One of the assertions uh, that was made in one of the hearings uh, was that uh, space uh, was not going to be uh, needed as much at the Port of Oakland because of changes going on that would uh, in, automate the system and that as a result of that, uh, this would free up space for the ballpark over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, do you agree with that? I've never heard that statement before. It's the first one I've ever heard that from. You know, we, we use all the land in Oakland that we got our hands on. I mean, the, the terminals are full. They're working at, you know, high capacity. Um, Oakland doesn't tend to be a, a, a you know a discretionary cargo port or some you know uh, intermodal port, but they do handle some. But most of the cargo that comes into Oakland is destined to Oakland because it's it's for the region, right? And and I don't see that going down. I see it going up. Yes, Das. I don't. I'm sorry, but I have to interject. I don't know that assertion you just made, Das, is never being a position of the port. That somehow we don't need uh, waterfront land for. For maritime purposes that we're somehow going to decrease our port uh, capacity. That is not the position of the Port of Oakland. Certainly we think that uh, so the, the power terminal issue is one that is uh, the port is not deep enough in terms of water. The infrastructure is not uh, up to the capacity of the big ships coming in today. It is currently used for container parking. So uh, it is a and it is a development that will be compatible if it ever happens with our port operation. So uh, we continue to grow. We intend to grow, Jim, just so you know, uh, you're correct that we continue to grow. We want as much discretion cargo as we can get, but also we're gonna focus our regional cargo and grow that. Uh, so that is our commitment, um, Jim, to you and your workers. Uh, Danny? I got a question for Jim, uh, this is Kim Araby. Um, you know, I see the ships are going higher and higher on deck, and we had a big catastrophe with one of the ships headed to uh, Mexico to offload all the damaged containers. Do you have anything, any insight into that area? And well, you know, the ships, ships are just getting bigger, right? I mean, that's, that's the name of the game, you know, economies of scale. Um, the, the bigger ships certainly are going into Southern California because, you know, the, the region demand is bigger and all the intermodal cargo that's on them. But, you know, they're, I, I don't know if they'll get much bigger. I think at, at some point in time, everybody said, you know, maybe 18,000 is the right number, not 22, 24. But those are commercial decisions. And, and that's what they're driven by. I don't know the exact circumstances for the ship you're talking about, Kim. Um, but it's, it's not unusual these days to see ships lose containers over the side due to weather, due to, you know, stowage, due to all kinds of concerns. Thankfully, it's not very frequent. Very good. Uh, uh, Danny, uh, I'm sorry if there was any confusion about that point. The question that I raised to Jim about the space was raised by the Oakland A's, not by the Port of Oakland. And uh, they did it at a hearing last year uh, based on a study that uh, they paid for, and that was an assertion, and I believe it was made at a BCDC meeting, and uh, that was the assertion. So I didn't mean to imply that the port had anything to do with that, and we're certainly very glad to hear from both you and Jim that we're going to need all the space that we can get. So sorry for that confusion. Uh, any other questions of Jim? 
Yeah, Stas, I have a question. This is Peter Olney. Hey, Jim, uh, about a year and a half, Soren Su, the uh, CEO of Maersk, said he was looking to transform their business model from 80% ocean carrier, 20% inland logistics to 50-50. And a lot of that is in response to the Amazon threat, Amazon talking about even buying ships. Right. What's your perception of the Amazon threat to traditional ocean carriers and to the PMA member companies? Well, I, I would just tell you, put it to you this way. Um, I think our member companies look at, at all options, all concerns. You know, you have some powerful players out there, whether it's Amazon, Walmart, Target. Um, you know, through the ages, there have been lots of rumors out there about, you know, individuals starting their own companies and, and going into the business. Um, this, is a, this is a very complicated business. Um, it takes a lot of logistics. It takes a lot of land. It takes a lot of skilled labor. Um, it's not something that you can wish to happen. Um, so I, I think everyone takes those threats seriously and they develop, you know, plans to address them if the cases do start to evolve. But I, I haven't heard of anybody, well, not that they share their commercial <laughs> decisions with me or plans, but I haven't heard of anybody saying this is, this is how we're going to, we're going to change this and we're going to change this now. So, yeah, I think it's on people's radars, but, but I, I don't know anybody that has actually made that, that, that quantum leap into a 50-50 split. Okay. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, other questions? Um, Evie, have, Evie Wong. I have a comment and, and a question. Um, Jim, uh, this is Evie Huang. I'm a customs broker and uh, one users of the port, uh, custom broker freight forwarder. And um, I'm also part of a couple organizations, one of which is ITC. And I'm gonna ask this question probably on behalf of Peter Friedman, which I didn't see him sign on. Um, the recent news with uh, exports uh, going out, uh, empties going out to Asia uh, and not fulfilling exports. Um, what is being done in the background to support that uh, this doesn't keep happening and uh, we get our US exports out? Um, Oakland is a 50-50 port. Uh, I'm an import uh, person, but uh, for my many years uh, being at the port, uh, meetings, I'm so supportive of what's happening on the export side. So could you comment on that? And uh, and I want to thank you for the comments you had about uh, supporting PMSA on the ballpark issue. Yeah, I can, I can make this short and sweet. <laughs> that's that's not what I do. Uh, the PMA doesn't doesn't tell, you know, liner companies or, or employers what they can lift, what they can't lift, how they lift it, where they lift it. That's not what we do. Um, those, those are commercial decisions. They're operational decisions that each company makes for themselves. And, you know, you'd, you'd have to go to them because I'd speculate like you speculate and I don't have any facts to back it up. So that's, okay. that's long and I, short. <laughs> I understood, but any, any support that you can have for us in, in the back, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Uh, other questions? Uh, Going once, um, anybody uh, got one last minute here? We, Jim has a, oh yes, John, John Burge, go ahead. Yeah, hi Jim, uh, uh, thanks again for the comments. Uh, maybe kind of a tough question, but of the various kind of burdens and impediments we have in terms of port competitiveness, is there anything that is relatively speaking low hanging fruit that we could target? No, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. Um, these are all tied together. There are a lot of, a lot of moving pieces here. Um, I, think, I think we have, you know, as we've tried to put together this, this resource group, I think that, you know, the, the, we need labor involved. They haven't been involved. I mean, we've had one meeting. It's not like we've had a million of them. Um, but, but I think the people are there, the port associations, the railroads, uh, PMA, PMSA, we need labor in the room and we probably need government in the room. Right. But but as I said, there, there was one meeting. I don't know. I'm taking a stab here seven, eight months ago. And 
there was going to be a follow-up meeting and then all of a sudden we hit into about August and we saw things start to spike and I tell you our attention is is solely on keeping the workforce you know healthy at this given time so you know I, I think even if there was some low-hanging fruit we probably would have hit it in the first meeting say why don't we just do this uh, and I didn't hear that come out of anybody's mouth so it's it's more complicated than that and it's going to take a, a lot of different you know, efforts on a lot of different people to make it to uh, get us more competitive. You know, we, we do have the time advantage, you know, three, four, in some cases, it's six or seven days. And that's, there's something to be said for that. And I think that's why you're seeing such a congestion point on the West Coast of the U.S. Because they want to get these ships in, they want to get them unloaded as quickly as they can and get it back to Asia. Well, even, even with a seven day, four to seven day, you know, at Anchorage or turnaround time down in Southern California, um, they're still coming here. Right. They're still coming to Southern California. Some have been diverted up to Oakland because it's still regional. Few have been diverted up north, but it's the West Coast serves as a place to turn the ships the fastest, even in these times. Um, so, so that's an advantage that, that certainly we need to continue to talk about. But the others are, are, are pretty big issues. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we heard from Ed DeNike a couple of weeks ago that he was concerned about uh, negotiations next year on the contract. Um, and uh, He said he thought it was going to be a difficult negotiation. Um, is there a cause for concern? There's always a cause for concern. These, these, are, these are large contracts. They, they impact a lot of people's lives. Uh, they're never easy. Um, there's just a lot, again, there's, there's a lot of issues that come up, some of them bigger than others. Um, I think we'll get through it, right? Uh, the, the hope is we'll get through it without without any you know impact to operations. But each contract is onto itself, right? And I think both sides try and do what they can for their constituents. And somehow we always try we always find a way to to hit middle ground. But by trying to handicap, it's impossible. Very Some good. have gone gone a lot easier than than we thought. Some have been a lot harder than we thought. So it's uh, it's it just matters the issues we deal with. Very good. Jim, thank you very, very much. Uh, My pleasure. Um, I, I think we have one second for more, one more question if there is one. Okay, Jim, uh, you've been very, very complete today. Uh, you've given us a really excellent overview of what we are looking at right now. Uh, it was very concise. I'm very impressed that you had the number down to 17 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> well, you told me I only had 20. I didn't want to, you know, overstay my welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I, I want to say that uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Lars Jensen from Sea Intelligence, and uh, he's going to be speaking to us in three weeks, three weeks from today. Uh, so you'll get a no notification about that. The Propeller Club uh, is due for its memberships. And hey, Stas, uh, hey, Stas, I'm going to have to jump off on you now. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank right you now. very much, Jim. Thank you. Uh, the Propeller Club is uh, uh, memberships are going out uh, in the next few days, so just be out looking for those. Uh, we welcome uh, anybody's participation uh, in terms of. Uh, helping us out. Uh, as you know, we have tried to keep everybody in the loop on what has been going on on the waterfront during the last year with a pandemic. Uh, but I have to say again, just echoing what Jim said, a lot of the really important and good work has been done by the people on this call. And I want to echo what Jim said about the ILWU. Uh, I was really appalled to hear that 12 people have died um, in Southern California uh, in the last year. Uh, that is really a staggering number. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, that uh, the situation is not as bad here uh, in Oakland and that we have a, a better situation, but it is an indication of how risky uh, those longshoremen, uh, the risk the longshoremen face getting out and doing the job that they need to do, uh, but they are working with truckers, with freight forwarders, uh, and with people like yourselves. And I want to thank you all for the good work you're doing. We have to hope that this is going to end uh, at some point and that we will get back to normal. 
Um, and I, I want to say to all of you, thank you for your service. We will see you in three weeks. Please take care of yourselves and please continue the good work that you do. Thank you very much and see you next time.